Good afternoon, everybody. Thank you for joining us today for the third webinar in Con Masiel Carey's 2017 OSHA webinar series. Um, the faceless voice you're hearing right now is Eric Kahn. I'm the chair of the uh, OSHA practice at Con Masiel, and I'm delighted to be joined today by my uh, associate, Dan Deacon. Uh, what we're covering today is, uh, has actually been sort of an evolving topic. Uh, since we set up the, um, uh, the program description. That's one of the challenges of putting a, a, an annual program together before a major national election is that some, some of the topics that we thought we might be talking about uh, have become irrelevant, and there's other really, really interesting new topics uh, that it does make sense to cover. So we've actually uh, made a blended or hybrid uh, webinar today. So we set about to do a presentation on OSHA standards improvements, pr standards Improvement Project, which is a uh, Clinton-era uh, initiative that has uh, had a life cycle through a couple of different presidencies, and at the end of the Obama administration, there was a, uh, a rather novel approach by OSHA to use the SIP for a controversial change related to lockout-tagout. So we will cover that today, but in the spirit of the Standards Improvement Project, we thought it also made sense to talk about some efforts by the, the new Trump administration to sort of put the Standards Improvement Project on steroids and really address the regulatory scheme in very significant ways. So that's what we're going to be talking about today. Let me tell you a little bit about, uh, more about myself, I, although I recognize most of you on the line, but, but some newcomers, so just tell you real quickly. Uh, I'm the chair of the OSHA Workplace Safety Practice at Con Masiel Carey. My practice focuses exclusively on occupational safety and health law, and my practice does range sort of the soup to nuts uh, safety and health law practice. I work with employers through inspections, investigations, and enforcement actions involving OSHA, the state OSHA programs, the Chemical Safety Board, which is under fire right now under Trump's uh, proposed budget, uh, the Mine Safety and Health Administration, and the Environmental Protection Agency, uh, and particularly uh, where that overlaps with workplace safety and health issues uh, like risk management program and process safety management. Uh, I work with employers to manage investigations of catastrophic industrial construction and manufacturing incidents uh, and handle the full range of OSHA litigation from challenges to OSHA citations uh, to criminal prosecutions for willful violations that cause employee fatalities. I write and speak regularly on safety and health law issues like I'm doing today uh, and work with employers and consultants uh, to conduct safety training, to develop compliant safety programs, and to provide counseling for employers. I'm going to let Dan introduce himself and then we'll jump into our topic for the day. Hello everyone, my name is Dan Deacon and I am an associate here at Conway Seal Carey. I work closely with Eric in the OSHA practice group. Um, and in doing so, I represent employers during inspections and investigations um, in federal and state OSHA matters. I also advise and counsel employers in responding to, responding to notices of uh, employee safety complaints and citations um, issued from OSHA. And I represent and advise employers in all aspects of the employer-employee relationship, including uh, employment law matters, uh, wage and hour disputes, and claims of discrimination. And I also help out reviewing uh, and revising employee handbooks and, and workplace policies and procedures. All right, so I gave you a little preview of what we're going to cover today. We'll start off with that history of OSHA Standards Improvement Project. What is it? How's it been used historically? And then we'll talk about this one controversial change that was initiated uh, under the Obama administration under that Standards Improvement Project. Talk a little bit about what's happening with that, what may happen with that under the new administration, and then really focus most of today on uh, President Trump's efforts uh, some in conjunction with Congress, some uh, through executive actions uh, to, to slash regulation or as, um, uh, as one of his advisors, Steve Bannon, put it, to systematically dismantle the regulatory state. Uh, I, I wake up in a cold sweat hearing that as a regulatory defense lawyer, but good news for, for many of you, most of my clients uh, on the line as well. So what is OSHA's Standards Improvement Project? Uh, OSHA Standards Improvement Project uh, was initiated back in 1995 in response to a, an executive order from President Bill Clinton, and the executive order was called Improving Regulations and Regulatory Review. And it actually, in sort of announcing this initiative, President Clinton used a lot of the same language, not quite as dramatic 
as we're hearing from the Trump administration about minimizing the burden of regulations on employers, um, you know, cutting the red tape, uh, rewarding results, uh, re rather the performance of your agency, those types of results, rather than sort of the number of citations that are issued, things like that. So this was sort of the, maybe the beginnings of this sort of dismantling the regulatory state that we're seeing uh, in hyperdrive under the new administration. So that was the executive order, and what it was intended to do, the standards improvement project that grew out of that, was intended to remove or revise standards that had uh, duplication, uh, that had unnecessary or inconsistent application across different industries, uh, or in a lot of instances where you had, you know, old, you know, old uh, chemical exposure standards that had different requirements than newer chemical exposure standards because technology had changed or science had changed or the regulatory scheme had changed, an effort to sort of reconcile those and sync up uh, the style of enforcement across uh, older and newer standards to account for you know, modernization. So generally speaking, and certainly by the express intent of President Clinton when he announced the initiative, is this was, in, it was intended to make non-controversial changes, changes that industry would not object to because they would ease their burden, uh, lower costs, um, and address, uh, uh, address confusing, outdated, or dupl duplicative or inconsistent standards. Uh, and they set about to do that back in uh, the Clinton administration, carried on through the Bush administration, and as well into the Obama administration as well. Um, the, the, uh, and this is uh, David Michaels, the uh, longest uh, tenured Assistant Secretary of Labor for OSHA, uh, sort of talking about SIP. This is to show you sort of that the book ends where it began with the Clinton administration and what the Obama era OSHA uh, intended by the SIP as well. This is Michael saying that the changes that we propose under the SIP are intended to modernize OSHA standards, help employers better understand their responsibilities, increase compliance and reduce compliance cost. So the concept continued through the Obama administration. And we've seen that the SIP um, project uh, has been used uh, several times over, you know, as I said, multiple different administrations. The first in 1998, uh, then in 2005, then through 2011, and then finally SIP4 uh, initiated under the, um, uh, under the Obama administration in the waning days of the Obama administration. And so we'll talk a little bit about how really up until this final announcement by the Obama OSHA team, that SIP has, has sort of carried out its mission faithfully, that it has made non-controversial changes, it has made changes that have reduced burdens, it has made changes that have been um, you know, uh, basically accepted by industry. So, you know, SIP phase two, for example, included some pretty minor, um, uh, minor changes or changes to synchronize standards across different industries. So some examples here, um, uh, revising employee notification requirements under some of the chemical specific general industry standards. This was an example where some of the older standards uh, or really just inconsistently across some of the chemical standards, talked about delivering monitoring results, personal monitoring results to employees in a personal one-on-one face-to-face -on -one meeting where other standards permitted the posting of results or meeting individually or delivering the results in writing. What the SIP phase two would do for those standards would be to synchronize it and to allow you know, all of the multiple forms of delivery of these types of um, uh, 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 of data to employees, all would be allowed under all of the chemical uh, exposure standards. Uh, and OSHA reasoned that there was nothing unique about some of the different chemicals that were being addressed by the standards that would make a face-to-face -face meeting more necessary uh, than the other standards. So this would just be a way to eliminate confusion, consolidate, uh, and make consistent the requirements under the chemical exposure standards. That was welcomed by industry, and it has resulted in you know, more consistent application and a welcome change um, uh, by industry. Other requirements that were addressed uh, were eliminating some of the reporting requirements in the standards. Uh, 
Um, and again, the, you know, these in some instances may not be minor changes, but they are changes that move towards the direction of easing employer burden, and so they were welcomed by industry. And we saw some of those where you know semi-annual updating of compliance plans uh, were eliminated, uh, employer reporting requirements for certain types of incidents, certain types of exposures uh, were eliminated under this SIP, um, and notification and timing requirements across standards. Uh, were made to be um, uh, consistent. Uh, and those were across standards, sometimes uh, different chemicals, and likewise across standards where a construction standard and a general industry standard were not consistent, and they were made to be consistent through these changes. So this was a successful application of SIP uh, and not much pushback or any pushback from industry. SIP phase three, similarly non-controversial changes that were by and large uh, embraced by um, by employers. Um, for example, in that instance, uh, making air cylinder tests under self-contained breathing apparatus requirements under the respiratory protection standard were uh, uh, synchronized with DOT regulation requirements. So the same test could be used to comply with different regulatory schemes, easing the burden on employers. Um, likewise, deleting several requirements for employers to transmit exposure or medical records to NIOSH, uh, is simplifying the burden on um, the medical records and, and a, uh, employee exposure record standards. Um, through a series of changes, these are just some examples, but through that series of changes, OSHA estimated that uh, employers were able to uh, save $43 million per year under those types of changes. So those were welcome changes, the sort of things that employers were happy to see uh, through, the, um, through this rulemaking process. SIP uh, Standards Improvement Project Phase 4 comes along at the tail end of the Obama administration and by and large looks like you know, the other iterations of the SIP. It has a lot of changes that were welcome uh, by industry. You know, there was an example about feral cats uh, feral cats were called out specifically in OSHA's sanitation standard as part of the type of vermin infestation uh, that were required to be addressed by employers, but this SIP would eliminate feral cats from the definition because OSHA recognized that they pose really a minor, if any, threat at all, uh, and they tend to avoid human contact. So let's simplify the definition uh, of, uh, of you know, of vermin in the sanitation standard. A welcome change, it creates no new burden for employers, only eases burden on employers. Uh, likewise, the process safety management standard for construction uh, it is basically identical to the process safety management standard in general industry, yet it takes up a whole bunch of pages of the, of the, uh, of the CFR. So OSHA proposed in this, um, in this SIP to basically eliminate all of the sort of duplicative language uh, and just include a simple cross-reference to the general industry standard. So again, simplifying the regulatory scheme, synchronizing uh, requirements across different standards. And there were a lot of examples like that where um, this SIP would, in diff different instances and in different contexts, clarify that the construction uh, requirements, for example, personal protective equipment, uh, make them consistent with general industry requirements. So it was about consistency, easing burden. Um, yeah, another good example was uh, not listed on the slide here, but there was one that required uh, lots of standards that actually reference including employee social security numbers in certain records, like your uh, medical surveillance records, exposure monitor records, and a variety of other records that OSHA standards require you to generate. Well, this SIP proposed to eliminate the requirement to include Social Security numbers in any of these records uh, to minimize, uh, to you know, enhance employee privacy and minimize uh, a potential for identity fraud. So good, welcome changes. There was, however, one change that was sort of slipped in uh, that was not minor at all. And it was certainly not non-controversial, and that was a change to OSHA's lockout tagout standard. And we'll talk about that one in some detail um, and talk about what may happen with this proposed change uh, as the Trump administration really takes hold. And that was a so-called minor change or clarification to OSHA's lockout tagout standard. 
So we'll give a little bit of context to this. And, and, and you know, just real interestingly, I'll, I'll share with you what I saw as an interesting kind of parallel rulemaking uh, to this effort under the SIP to change the, the uh, lockout-tagout standard is the effort that OSHA undertook through a formal rulemaking um, to clarify the injury and illness record-keeping standard um, uh, to extend the statute of limitations from six months to five years. And I'll explain sort of the similarities and differences in the approach that OSHA took and why I think that's interesting in just a moment. So you go back to the original lockout tagout standard, which was promulgated back in 1989, and you look at the plain language of the standard. The scope and application says the lockout tagout requirements apply when there is an effort to service or maintain machines or equipment in which, and this is where it gets controversial, the original standard says, in which that equipment, unexpected energization or startup of that machine or equipment, or the release of stored energy could harm an employee. So the original standard contemplated that it's only circumstances where there may be unexpected energization that could harm an employee that triggers the requirement to do lockout tagout. Now the standard did not specifically define the term unexpected energization, but OSHA uh, did define it through interpretation letters and you know through uh, you know arguments that it made in the enforcement context its compliance directives to the area offices and so forth, and OSHA's definition that it attached to unexpected energization was unintended, unanticipated, or unplanned for. And OSHA has sort of applied the lockout tagout standard and enforced the law between 1989 and 1996, and we'll talk about what happened in 1996, consistently with that definition unintended, unanticipated, unplanned for. That's what's meant by unexpected energization. In 1996, the Sixth Circuit decided a case, um, the Secretary of Labor versus General Motors Delco. Uh, and in that case, I'll just give you the facts very briefly, um, OSHA observed during an inspection that employees maintained three specific machines. And on these machines, when the employee was getting ready to start servicing the machine, uh, he or she would pass through an electronic interlock gate, and that as soon as you pass through that interlock, the machine would deactivate, and the machine would open and allow the employee to perform service or maintenance while the machine was deactivated. Once the machine was deactivated, a, a, a process, depending on the machine, an 8- to 12-step process uh, would have to, you know, would have to trigger uh, to allow the machine to restart. And each of those machines, and during that process, during that 8 to 12 step process, while the machine is reactivating, there is a series of audible and visual signals that signal to the employee, hey, this machine is about to start up. And you've got this delayed, extended period of time for the employee to remove himself or herself from a zone of danger while the machine is restarting. Uh, OSHA saw that and nevertheless said, you're not applying a lockout tagout device, even though you're performing service and maintenance on this machine. And based on our historical theory, that it's not about foreknowledge that a machine is about to start. It's about whether you intend for the machine to start. And here, while you're performing service or, or maintenance, you do not intend for the machine to restart, even if you're given a lot of warning. So OSHA uh, cited the employer uh, for a variety of lockout tagout violations related to these activities. And OSHA argued in the case that employees could be injured if the equipment is energized during servicing. And so obviously you don't intend for the machine to reactivate, and you could be injured if the machine does reactivate. That's enough for Lotto to apply. The Sixth Circuit disagreed, and they rejected OSHA's longstanding interpretation of unexpected and said, well, that's nice that that's what you think unexpected means, OSHA, but the fact of the matter is the standard itself is unambiguous. And when the standard is unambiguous, we don't need to defer to your interpretation. And here, the lockouts tagout standard is unambiguous, where it says unexpected energization. Uh, it unambiguously renders the lockout tagout standard inapplicable where an employee is alerted or warned that the machine being serviced is about to reactivate. So in this circumstance, because the machine had a long startup process and during that process uh, 
sounded audible alarms, made visual cues with flashing lights and sirens and all that good stuff, but there was no way that the employee um, could be surprised by the startup of the machine. And the Sixth Circuit said, unexpected connotes an element of surprise. There can be no surprise when the machine is designed and constructed so that it cannot start up without giving a servicing employee notice about what's about to happen. So the Sixth Circuit rejected OSHA's decision, uh, re rejected OSHA's interpretation, knocked out these citations, and that became the law of the land in 1996. And for 20 years um, since that time, that has been the law of the land. Unexpected, has, unexpected energization has meant uh, no warning, no advance notice that the machine is about to restart. And if you have a machine that does give advance notice and advance warning and it's adequate, uh, then lockout tagout doesn't apply in those circumstances. So now through a, a, a rulemaking tool called the Standards Improvement Project that was intended to make minor clarifications, minor you know, synchronizing standards, eliminating confusion, and doing non-controversial changes that basically have worked in almost 100% of the, the instances to reduce employer burden, uh, OSHA tried to slip in a requirement to redefine unexpected energization and really redefine it in a way that writes the term unexpected energization right out of the standard. Um, OSHA asserted in this rulemaking record uh, for this SIP, and again, the rulemaking record here is a lot leaner than it would be in a standalone uh, proper Administrative Procedure Act rulemaking where you address the individual requirements of the standard, the cost-benefit need for the requirement, and identifying that it's feasible and that it's appropriate and that it is reasonably tailored to address a hazard. Uh, here, OSHA included a couple of bullets, a couple of statements in the, uh, in the SIP record that said, look, all we're doing here is returning the scope of the lockout tagout standard to our original intent. We're ensuring that lockout tagout is used instead of less effective warning systems without any evidence that those systems are less effective uh, than lockout tagout, and that we're trying to reduce the burden on inspectors who have needed to perform a case-by-case -case assessment of warning schemes and to eliminate confusion generally. And this is a quote right out of that uh, SIP uh, record saying that we're trying to improve protection of workers, eliminate confusion regarding applicability of the lotto standard um, caused by this specific decision um, and make things easier for our inspectors. But the reality is, and they point to this sort of confusion, the basis of the confusion is a handful of cases that have been decided since the GM case that reached a different outcome, and that's the Burks mechanical case in 2014 and the Otis elevator case in 2014. The problem is there's no confusion. There's not inconsistent application. Those cases did apply the GM Delco analysis. They just determined that there wasn't sufficient warning um, to, to really – constitute unexpected energization or to eliminate uh, unexpected energization. So there really is no confusion. Employers do understand this. It's been a very effective tool, one that employers have relied on, uh, and it is hardly uncontroversial uh, to eliminate that. So we have pushed back, um, and industry by, by and large has pushed back against this proposal and said, listen, this is a very significant change. If you want to make this sort of change, you need to do it through a formal, full, separate Administrative Procedure Act rulemaking, solicit and consider comments from stakeholders, hold a hearing, you know, do the, run the full gamut. Don't just sneak this change in as a supposed minor, non-controversial change. So OSHA was forging ahead with this and hoping to get this done, um, perhaps under Hillary Clinton administration. Perhaps they still believe they can get it done under the Trump administration. My expectation is that the SIP process itself will continue because it fits the model of you know, simplifying the regulatory scheme that the Trump administration is advancing. But I would be shocked to see that this particular change to lockout tagout continues with the rest of the 18 changes uh, that were proposed in, in SIP phase four. Um, it, it's a mystery what will happen. Uh, you know, certainly, uh, President Trump has not spoken directly to this issue. 
As of this moment, we don't have a Secretary of Labor yet, nor do we have an Assistant Secretary for OSHA or really any political appointees at OSHA. Uh, it looks like that's about to change very soon. I think we'll have uh, a Secretary Acosta confirmed um, probably Thursday of this week, uh, and hopefully we'll see you know, uh, uh, OSHA take shape um, with its uh, new personnel soon, and we'll get some clarity on what's likely to happen here. Uh, but regardless of what happens with this one individual rule uh, that we think is problematic, it's really been – oh, and, and just to close the loop on a point that I made earlier is, you know, OSHA was trying to use sort of this backdoor, you know, uh, standards improvement project to change the lotto standard in a way that I think was, was totally inappropriate. And they were doing it really for the purpose, you know, not hiding their cards at all, saying – we disagree with the GM Delco decision that the Sixth Circuit made, and so we're going to try and undo that, um, uh, that decision by way of a new regulation, but we're going to try and sneak it into this uh, SIP project that allows for minor non-controversial changes. An interesting way to try and backdoor a change to the law as interpreted by, um, uh, by the federal courts. If you've been following what's going on with the Volks rule, and the Volks rule, uh, if you don't know, is uh, OSHA's uh, effort to try to uh, restore its old five-year statute of limitations for injury and illness record keeping. In that case, the Volks decision by the D.C. Circuit said, OSHA, you're wrong. The OSHA Act does not allow an interpretation that record-keeping violations are continuing, which allow you to cite record-keeping violations for the five-year period that you're required to keep, physically keep a copy of your 300 log, uh, but instead record-keeping violations are bound by the same six-month statute of limitations as all other regulatory violations. In that instance, OSHA tried to do a rulemaking, a more proper Administrative Procedure Act full rulemaking, but they tried to do a rulemaking to change a regulation to undo a D.C. Circuit decision that said the statute, the OSH Act, prohibits you from doing this. That rule was struck down, as we'll talk about here briefly, through the Con uh, Congressional Review Act. I expect this rule will be undone just by uh, an active rulemaking that removes this uh, lotto component from the rulemaking if it advances at all. Or, um, or just eliminates the entire rulemaking effort. So let's talk about what we've seen just in you know, the first couple of months of the Trump administration, or really even from the campaign trail uh, to the um, you know, period where, where President Trump was the uh, president-elect, and now through a couple of months of his administration. This was a, a very significant statement. This is Steve Bannon, a senior policy advisor, really many consider to be the architect of uh, President Trump's at least regulatory policy, perhaps his overall governing policy in general. Uh, this was a, a speech that uh, Steve Bannon gave at the CPAC conference. And again, as a regulatory defense attorney, I wake up in cold sweat at night hearing this quote over and over again, that the president and this administration is going to systematically deconstruct the administrative state. And, and he talks about what does that mean? How are they going to go about doing this? And what's that going to look like? He says, look at our cabinet appointees, right? Look at um, the, uh, the, the new secretary of the um, uh, EPA, the administrator of the EPA, uh, actively involved in lawsuits challenging EPA regulations through his past life. You know, we've appointed someone to run an agency who's attacked the regulatory scheme of that agency. Uh, the governor of uh, – former governor of Texas, Rick Perry, uh, famously during his uh, campaign for president uh, in a prior election, uh, was naming the agencies he'd get rid of, and his whoops moment was the Department of, uh, of Energy. That was an, an agency that he wanted to absolve. Well, now he's the secretary of that very agency. So the cabinet appointees that were selected for a reason, and the reason is the deconstruction, Mr. Bannon says. The way the progressive left uh, ran things, ran government, is if they can't get it passed, meaning if they can't get legislation passed through Congress, they just make a new rule. They just put in place some regulation uh, through an agency to implement this agenda item they're trying to advance. That's all going to be deconstructed, he says. So the attack here is on the executive agency mechanism and the regulations advanced through those um, uh, you know, regulatory agencies. 
So we're seeing a lot of steps towards you know, how that's going to be done already. Uh, and we expect sort of a historic shift, and that historic shift in the way agencies operate is the execution of this plan to deconstruct the regulatory state. And so here are some things we anticipate and, in fact, some things we've already seen. Um, some executive orders that Dan's going to talk about in detail that will reform executive function and cut government regulations, cut the way regulations are made, uh, target specific regulations to be eliminated, and deal with the rulemaking process in general. Uh, we saw the proposed budget that's gotten a lot of press lately uh, that called for a $54 billion uh, cut in discretionary spending by government. Uh, and, and in particular, because we're talking about OSHA today, a $2.5 billion cut specifically targeted at the Department of Labor. And so OSHA falling under, the, and that was about a 21, 23% cut in, uh, in the Department of Labor's overall budget. OSHA, a pretty small budget agency within that, um, would feel that, I'm certain. Uh, what's interesting, too, about that $2.5 billion cut is that in the budget document itself, or the budget blueprint it's called, uh, they identify about $500 million worth of specific programs at the Department of Labor that would be cut. So there's $2 billion of cuts that are not really tied to any specific program that we are aware of at this point. And who knows what those are? Is it the enforcement program? Is it the rulemaking program? The whistleblower program? You know, lots of different elements of Department of Labor as well. So, you know, they're going to deconstruct the regulatory state by slashing the budget of the executive agencies, slashing the, you know, the resources that they ordinarily use to develop rules and to enforce rules. I, cer I certainly expect a shift in env enforcement philosophy. The Obama administration uh, ha had advanced a certainly enforcement-heavy, some would say enforcement-only uh, philosophy in the OSHA universe and, and many others as well. Uh, we expect to see, at the very least, a balanced approach to enforcement uh, where there will be enforcement, but there will also be compliance assistance and cooperative programs, partnerships and alliances. Uh, and I think that the proposed budget reflects some of what we're likely to see in that regard. Uh, interestingly, during the um, uh, confirmation hearing for uh, Secretary uh, nominee Acosta, he talked about the important role of enforcement and how his expectation would be that the levels we see now of regulators, of compliance officers at OSHA, uh, he would not like to see that shrink any more than it does uh, in any more than the current levels. Uh, so there might be a tension there between Trump and Bannon's expectations and Acosta's expectations. Uh, but that will be interesting to watch. Uh, and then a handful of things that, that Dan's going to talk about in detail. The Priebus memo that, you know, on day one of the Trump administration froze regulations, anything that wasn't in effect yet. Uh, there was a freeze in the effective date. Um, anything that hadn't been published yet, freeze, send it back to the agency in the White House for review. Uh, some rules that had been recently promulgated uh, squashed by the Congressional Review Act, and Dan will talk about that, what that is, how that works. Uh, and then some rules that are ha have been effective, uh, but there's active uh, legal challenges to those and what may happen with those. You know, under this deconstructing the regulatory state, I wouldn't be surprised to see the government not defend uh, some of those legal challenges that have been brought against the rules, or even opening the rulemaking record to rescind some of those rules. So. You know, this is the, the new world order here will be an effort to shrink government and shrink the regulatory state. And we'll talk about, Dan, uh, the rest of the way here, we'll talk about the tools that the, the Trump administration is going to use uh, to carry out that mission. Great. Thanks, Eric. I'm going to begin here by uh, talking a little bit about the Congressional Review Act and some of the steps that Congress is taking um, and picking up. Uh, I guess the, the slack on the regulatory side um, as part of this deconstruction of the, the regulatory state, um, you know, it, you can kind of anticipate possibly that Congress is going to assume some of that role in the future. After all, Congress is partly responsible for the, the large nature of the administrative state uh, as it was, uh, as it still is uh, currently. Um, you know, Congress passes broad bills that empower agencies to write more laws and impose more regulations. And, and we've already seen a dramatic <clears throat> uptick in uh, 
legislative action on, on executive uh, agency issues through the use of the Congressional Review Act. Um, Congress has passed joint resolutions um, on two important rules that affect employers, those being the, the FAR blacklisting rule, which required federal contractors and subcontractors of contracts valued at 500000 or more to disclose violations uh, of a number of different federal laws when su submitting proposals for jobs, and also the Volk's record-keeping rule, uh, statute of limitations rule that uh, Eric mentioned earlier. Um, so just to give you a little bit of a brief background of the Congressional Review Act here, it was passed in 1996 as a part of uh, then Speaker Newt Gingrich's uh, contract with America. Um, and, and while executive agencies can only issue regulations pursuant to to a statute that was passed by Congress, Congress wanted to find a way to make it a little easier to uh, overturn those regulations and have some, some type of review. Uh, previously, there was a process, it was, it was actually a little bit easier, where if one House of Congress voted to overturn the regulation, it was invalidated, and the Supreme Court ruled that that was unconstitutional in 1983. Uh, so for a while there, Congress was only able to overturn an, a, a regulation by, by passing a new law. Um, uh, now, under the Congressional Review Act, we have uh, an expedited procedure for Congress to repeal agency regulations by, by that joint resolution. Historically, however, this has is, is really been uh, an unsuccessful tool uh, for Congress to overturn regulation. It is, however, significant because it only requires a, a simple majority vote, uh, meaning it's not filibuster proof, and, and a CRA repeal of a rule prevents an agency from promulgating a substantially similar rule in the future. Um, so essentially what we have here is a 60-day period um, uh, or, or 60 session days in Congress uh, where they can use this expedited procedure to review and overturn a regulation. Um, and of course the, the President can still veto that decision. So ultimately this has kind of rendered the CRA relatively toothless uh, you know, over the years since its existence in 1996. So to, to overturn a regulation, the president who, who approved it would essentially need to uh, sign the legislation overturning it. And as you can imagine, uh, that wouldn't happen very often. Or his veto would need to be overridden by Congress. So not, neither of those conditions are likely under normal circumstances, except under circumstances that we have now, where we have a new president uh, that comes in uh, as part of a new party and his party uh, has control over both houses in Congress. So as I mentioned, uh, since it became law in 1996, there's been actually more than 120 resolutions introduced to cancel regulations promulgated by, by agencies. Um, and there's actually only been one uh, one CRA that has uh, successfully passed um, and was signed by the president, and that was actually an OSHA rule. That was uh, Bill Clinton, President Clinton's midnight ergonomics rule. However, what we've seen uh, recently during the first two months of President Trump's uh, uh, tenure here, we, we've and under this new Congress, uh, the 115th session that began on January 14th, I believe, uh, what we've seen is an unprecedented use of the CRA, and, and it's been successful. There have been a number of rules that were placed on the CRA chopping block, including the list that you see here on the screen, including a couple that you know we've already talked about that uh, affect employers, uh, particularly those being uh, the, the clarification or, or continuing obligation to make accurate and injury illness records, otherwise known as the Volks rule, and the, the FAR blacklisting rule, the contractor blacklisting rule that we discussed earlier as well. It's also worth pointing out that currently there's still a number of other bills that have been uh, introduced by one house or the other, and they're waiting for action um, or introduced to President Trump, and they're just waiting for a signature. And, and you know, we probably still have a month or so to go before uh, the use of the CRA is probably uh, no longer applicable, uh, given that 60-day review period, 60 legislative day review period. And sort of relevant to many of you on the call probably is that the one particular regulation that is under serious consideration, a lot of activity uh, at Congress right now is around the EPA's risk management plan rule, which uh, uh, pretty controversial, it does a handful of pretty controversial things. It also most importantly sort of deviates from what OSHA's PSM standard has required 
uh, for many years, and those rules were supposed to be uh, synchronized. Um, so it, it's a pretty controversial um, uh, rule, and um, uh, there is a good chance that that gets taken up uh, through the Congressional Review Act as well. Great. So I'm going to talk a little bit about the Priebus memo, uh, which was issued day one uh, when, when Trump took office, January 20th, 2017. Um, and, and this was one of those uh, uh, memos or the executive orders that, that I'll be talking about in detail more that is designed to basically restructure the way in which regulatory agencies operate, uh, including, of course, the Department of Labor. And OSHA, it was immediately uh, it, it immediately established the tone uh, for the administration and their message to eliminate government regulation and, and put limit on the administrative power. Uh, so the previous memo specifically states that no new regulations can be published unless a Trump appointee personally approves it. To Obama era regulations that have not yet been published in the Federal Register should be immediately withdrawn. And three, the effective date. Of the Obama regulations that have been that had been published uh, but had not yet taken effect uh, would be postponed for 60 days to allow the new administration to review them, uh, to review questions of fact, law, and policy. Uh, so this memo had a, a pretty profound impact on executive agencies, and it really got the ball rolling on not only halting several proposed rules, but immediately directed the agency's attention uh, towards taking uh, steps to make sure that they did not become final and begin considering other rules uh, that, that were ripe for, for repeal. And again, a couple months later, or a couple weeks, I should say, March 13, 2017, uh, President Trump issued Executive Order uh, 13781. Um, and this is, uh, this is a major change to how the executive branch is, is basically run. Uh, and more specifically, how executive agencies should be shaped in the future. Um, the, the head of the, the executive order directs the head of each agency essentially to submit a plan to reorganize that agency. It's basically an, an internal re review, so to speak, um, by the head of that agency to, you know, determine uh, whether they have the right staff, what type of programs are effective, and which are not effective, and then they need to submit that plan to the director of OMB. The OMB director is then directed to publish a notice in the Federal Register inviting uh, public comment uh, to suggest improvements in the organization and function uh, of the executive branch. Um, so, so what does this provide an opportunity for? Uh, it, it provides an opportunity for employers to comment on those programs and the departments that may or may be useful or, or not so useful, and, and you could have a role in, in shaping the executive agencies. Um, and this is something that we're certainly going to keep our, our eye on for all of you, and we can apprise you of any updates uh, on our blogs. All right, the next one here is Executive Order 13771, uh, uh, and this was issued only about a week after, uh, a little over a week after President Trump took office. Uh, and this is commonly known as that, that two-for-one uh, executive order. Um, basically, so for every one new regulation that's introduced, you need to repeal two regulations. Uh, and this is only for fiscal year 2017, which ends September 30th, 2017. So that's only about six months from now. Uh, but essentially, it, this executive order did three things. One, for each new regulation published uh, for notice and comment, uh, or otherwise promulgated, the agency had to identify two existing regulations to be repealed. Repeal. Note, though, that the order doesn't require that repeal to be concurrent with the publication or, or promulgation of, of the new regulation. Um, and the OMB guidance that was issued shortly after, um, in early February, uh, didn't really provide any clarification on this either. It said it only needs to identify the associated regulatory actions that were uh, subject to repeal no later than the date of issuance of the new significant regulatory action. And, and we're just going to have to wait and see how this plays out, and we expect more guidance will, will be issued by OMB in the future. Two, each agency must ensure that the total incremental cost of all new and repealed regulations uh, does not exceed zero, uh, unless other, otherwise required by law. So basically, a net cost of zero between 
the new regulation and the two uh, that are proposed to be repealed. Three, uh, to the extent uh, permitted by law, the cost of the new regulation need to be offset, as I said, by the two existing ones. And finally, OMB was directed to provide guidance, which was issued on February 2nd, 2017. Uh, it provided some guidance, albeit minimal, and I'll touch on that here right now. Um, as I hinted on that prior slide, there's, there's some problems or concerns about how, how this uh, executive order is really going to be implemented and how it will operate. Uh, much hinges on the interpretation of costs uh, that are re uh, referenced throughout the order. Um, does it mean cost to the agency, the entire federal government, or, or the public at large? And particularly if costs are defined broadly, how are the agencies uh, or OMB instructed to calculate those costs? Um, OMB is presumably going to you know, arrive at those answers uh, and, and provide answers to those fundamental questions in the near future. Um, but they're going to need to elaborate on this. Uh, second, while a rule has a defined meaning in administrative law, regulation doesn't. Uh, while the order purports to define the term, uh, as many of you already know, individual sections within the CFR, the Code of Federal Regulations, are called regulations, uh, and, and they come in many shapes and sizes. So does this mean an agen agency can satisfy that two-for-one rule by replacing uh, a one-sentence regulation with, with a 10- or 20-sentence uh, regulation, something that's more robust. Um, we, we don't have any clarification on that, but the opportunity to somewhat manipulate the order's, the order's mandate seems uh, kind of endless. Uh, and finally, the executive order might accelerate the unfortunate trend of agencies uh, making rules through informal documents instead of the notice and comment rulemaking procedure. And this is something that we've seen uh, in the past, the, the past several decades. Many agencies have sought to shortcut that rulemaking process by issuing uh, interpretation and, and, and guidance that wasn't subject to that notice and comment uh, rulemaking. Um, so a, as I mentioned, on February 2nd, uh, OMB issued interim guidance clarifying, clarifying this order, uh, which gave some minor clarity um, Specifically, however, and, and this is important, it said that the executive order is only going to apply to new significant regulatory actions as uh, defined in Section 3F of Executive Order 12866, which was an executive order issued by uh, Bill Clinton, I believe. And that's defined, significant regulatory action is defined uh, as any regulatory actions that is likely to result in a rule that may, one, have an annual effect on the economy of $100 million or more, or ad adversely affect in a material way the economy. Two, create a serious inconsistency or otherwise interfere with an action taken or planned by another agency. Three, materially alter the budgetary impact of entitlements, grants, uh, fees, or loan programs, or, or the recipients thereof. Uh, or four, raise novel legal or policy issues arising out of legal mandates. So it kind of narrows the effect of, of the executive order there uh, a little bit. Uh, a couple other uh, items to note there uh, regarding the, the OMB guidance uh, and the executive order here is that it uses the term regulation broadly. Uh, and, and as I mentioned, we, we really don't have um, the, the definition clarified here in the executive order or elsewhere. Um, but it suggests that the directive uh, is also applicable to agency guidance and documents. Uh, including interpretation letters. Um, OMB specifically mentioned that in the guidance, that these are going to be considered on a case-by-case -case basis. Um, uh, additionally, the, the guidance states that OMB is going to consider regulations cut by Congress under the CRA in applying the two-for-one formula. Uh, so as we've seen, Congress has already undertaken several uh, steps and has already cut several regulations passed by the previous administration. Uh, so this may already affect uh, you know, rules going forward, and we may not see, at least from now until the end of fiscal year 2017, uh, several other rules that are going to be to be uh, cut. Finally, we have Executive Order uh, 13777, and this order is essentially a directive to implement a, a system to review current government regulation and evaluate 
whether they're suitable for repeal, replacement, or modification. Um, and this is kind of President Trump's way of streamlining that deconstruction process uh, and making sure that current uh, regulations really get a hard look um, at whether they're effective uh, and worth keeping around. Um, so the order directs the head of every agency, uh, except those, there's a few receiving a waiver, to designate an agency, agency official as its regulatory reform officer, and they're going to oversee the implementation of, of reform initiatives and, and policies to ensure that the agencies carry out these regulatory reforms. Um, the order also establishes this regulatory reform task force uh, forces, and, and that's going to consist of agency uh, regulatory reform officers and other, other agency officials, um, and those task forces are going to evaluate existing regulations and make recommendations to the agency head regarding the repeal, replacement, or modification. Um, and basically, they're going to be tasked with identifying uh, regulations that eliminate jobs or inhibit job creation, uh, regulations that are outdated, unnecessary, or ineffective, that impose costs and exceed, uh, that exceed benefits um, and that are inconsistent or otherwise interfere with, with other reform initiatives. Um, so ultimately, what do we have here in the first two months of, of the Trump administration? We have, uh, one, the previous memo implementing that immediate freeze and the directive, directive to take a hard look at all these regulations that were passed under the uh, Obama administration. And then we have three executive orders that are designed to just reshape the uh, executive agencies and, and thin them out, basically. We're not only going to stop uh, introducing so many uh, new rules, but we're also going to cut existing ones and, and take, uh, make a conscious effort to, to repeal these regulations that are currently in effect. So what does all this mean for OSHA and what can we expect? Uh, well, one thing's for certain, we, we know that OSHA is probably going to be one of the agencies uh, targeted by the new administration for serious changes, as with you know, several other sub-agencies of DOL. Um, however, OSHA in particular, coming towards the end of the Obama administration, we saw a lot of action from OSHA, uh, which prompted several industry challenges uh, and displeasure with employers. Eric mentioned that a, a little earlier. Um, and as such, there's, there's going to be a lot of activity once OSHA is set up under the new, uh, new administration, once they're set up uh, at DOL, uh, and, and we're going to probably see some repeal of un unfavorable rules. Uh, since the campaign, the administration has, has focused really on decreasing regulation and taking steps to, to keep the government out of the workplace. Um, so one thing that we, we could expect or, or that, could, that we could see is a rise uh, in state plan states, where in the states are going to be given more jurisdiction uh, to enforce workplace uh, safety violations. And we're also going to see a repeal of, of several rules that were promulgated uh, in, the, in the final days of the Obama administration, uh, some that weren't finalized yet, uh, and some of which have, have already been affected by the previous memo. Um, and those, those right there include silica rule, the, the e-record keeping and anti-retaliation provisions. As well, and and with respect to both of those rules, there have been signals from different parts of uh, of the administration uh, that they may not be defended, that they that they are um, are vulnerable. Uh, for example, the silica rule specifically. Oh, you're talking about that. Yeah. Mm -hmm. All right. <laughs> yep. No worries. That's what we were going to uh, discuss next. Um, and this uh, is OSHA silica rule. Um, it's one of the most significant health standards created by the agency, and it was in the works for over. 15 years, um, so it's kind of a legacy project for OSHA uh, under, under the previous administration. Uh, and while the rule took effect June 23, 2016, employers have a little, a little time to adjust. The compliance dates uh, for different requirements are staggered with a June 23, 2017 deadline for employers in the construction industry uh, and June 2018, June 23, 2018 for uh, those in the general industry and maritime operations. Um, however, what we saw here, uh, as with some of the other rules that were promulgated uh, by the Obama administration, was an immediate uh, challenge uh, by the industry. Um, and, and particularly for the silica rule, we had a, a challenge in the D.C. Circuit, the North American Building Trade Unions versus OSHA. Um, and DOL, at least now, has decided to defend this rule, as evidenced by their brief filed on uh, 
March 23rd, 2017. Uh, they stated that substantial evidence backs OSHA's findings that workers face significant risk uh, under the prior uh, permissible exp exposure limit, and that the new rules, or that the rules new limit is technologically and economically feasible. So we're going to have to wait and see what the outcome of this case will be uh, in light of, of OSHA defending that now, uh, and whether the new administration is really going to decide to leave it, uh, leave it alone, or, or take further action on it. Interestingly, uh, I think it was the day before um, that DOL filed their uh, their defense in the silica rule um, during Alex Acosta's confirmation hearing. He, he said that he couldn't make a commitment to preserving the silica rule when asked by Senator Warren, um, essentially indicating that it may be uh, something that, that OSHA will pursue in the future. But as, as of right now, DOL is defending that in, the, in that lawsuit. And finally here, we're going to talk briefly about the e-record keeping rule and the anti-retaliation provisions, um, both of which uh, may implicate action under under the executive orders 13771 and 13777. As you all know, the electronic injury record keeping uh, rule requires certain high hazard industries uh, to submit uh, OSHA 300 logs um, uh, by this July 2017 uh, establishment. Sorry, in that in that high hazard category, 20 plus with 20 plus employees, and then it's otherwise employer, employers with 250 plus employees are going to have to submit those OSHA 300 logs, 301 incident reports, and 300A annual summaries by that deadline. Um, this was another rule that prompted an industry challenge, uh, which the challenge was also filed with an emergency motion for a temporary injunction, which was ultimately denied, uh, I believe it was right around Thanksgiving. So the rule is currently in, in full effect, and it's been in full effect as of December 1, 2016. Uh, recently, uh, February 27th, 2017, there was a motion to intervene, uh, the Texas AFL-CIO and United Steelworkers asked, uh, asked the judge to allow them to defend the rule, uh, saying that they needed to intervene in case the Trump administration abandoned its defense of the rule. Um, and on March 17th, 2017, OSHA requested a 60-day stay in the case and filed an unopposed motion for an extension of time to file proposed summary judgment briefing schedule uh, and to respond to that uh, intervener's motion. Um, so there's been no rulings on these yet, uh, but ultimately this is going to be uh, another rule that is a high target to be repealed. Um, well, it's not subject to uh, a 60-day delay uh, as called for in the previous memo. It's likely going to be repealed uh, by the new administration uh, in such a case, it would, it would easily be the subject of, of that executive order 13771, uh, where, in the, where in the agency is going to be uh, cutting two regulations for each new one introduced. That could be one that is easily cut by the new administration. Um, and it's also going to be a long process to undo that rule uh, through rulemaking. But in the short term, there's going to be other, other ways, effective ways that the new administration can uh, can limit the effectiveness uh, of this rule. And, and of course, as I mentioned, that's going to be in the short term. They can issue uh, new letters of interpretation taking basically a 180 degree view uh, on these views. Um, and unions and others, they might challenge these actions, but uh, courts have historically deferred to agencies' interpretations of, of its own regulations. Um, and the immediate effect of, of that new guidance or, or letters of interpretation would be to prevent OSHA from issuing citations to employers that have, the, uh, you know, these policies that the, the Obama administration disfavored. Uh, and this issue could also be foreclosed with a budget rider, um, wherein the provisions will essentially just not be enforced. And this, in particular, the, this e-record keeping rule is uniquely uh, uh, vulnerable or appropriate for that type of action because there is dollars being spent presently on sort of building this database to collect the data, and that would be an easy example for um, for the agency to, or, or for the administration to say you may no longer spend any money building this database to collect the data, and then there is no data collection. There's nowhere for employers to send the data. So I, I think there's lots of ways these things could be changed. The anti-retaliation elements.
uh, you know, the, the, those are the provisions that have called into question employers' ability to do post-incident drug testing and to do um, uh, certain safety incentive programs, although those terms don't exist in the regulation itself. The regulation just says reasonable reporting policies, and OSHA has interpreted that to mean drug testing and, um, uh, and safety incentives. Well, they could just write a new interpretation letter or guidance document or compliance directive that says, you know, reasonable means, you know, not unrestrictive time limit or don't make them jump through too many hoops to report an injury. This has nothing to do with drug testing or safety incentive programs. So there's easy ways to address this by the new administration short of rescinding the rules, although I think rescinding the rules uh, would be <laughs> something that, uh, that that is attractive to the new administration and because of these executive orders, would show that they, you know, the agencies are following through on Trump's order and perhaps getting some value and credit for the two-for-one swap if there is something else that they do favor and they do want to advance. Uh, so that's what we had uh, to, to cover today on, um, you know, the, the fate of the regulatory state under the Trump administration. Uh, I encourage you all to join us for the rest of the webinars in our OSHA webinar series. Another one coming up in just a couple of weeks on Cal OSHA issues, uh, an agency that, that may feel the need to fight the good fight um, because federal OSHA is changing directions. Cal OSHA as a state plan uh, may feel that it needs to step in and, uh, and be the standard bearer for workforce uh, uh, safety. Uh, and they're doing things like advancing rules that Fed OSHA has passed on, like worker sa uh, workplace safety, heat il I'm sorry, workplace violence, heat illness, and things like that. So it should be an interesting discussion, even if you don't operate in California, to sort of get a sense of what might happen in the next Democratic administration under federal OSHA, or to understand what standards may be being set in areas where you do operate or that may affect your operations. And then obviously the rest of the year, some of these may change. For example, we've got one uh, scheduled in August about the FAR blacklisting rule that is now dead. We'll replace that with something else. Um, and then I always encourage uh, you all to check out our blog, the OSHA Defense Report, www.oshadefensereport.com. Uh, we spend a lot of time keeping the content there fresh and would love to know that uh, you all are getting value from that. Um, so if you've got questions, uh, uh, type them into that chat box right now or send us an email or give us a call after the webinar today, and we're happy to, um, to address those. And uh, if you wanted to reach out to us after today, here's our contact information. And I want to thank you all again for joining us for uh, another webinar. We really enjoy doing these, and we love that uh, so many of you are, are interested and continue to join us. And we hope you do for the rest of the year.